Good evening. If we could settle in and get ready for tonight's service. If you have a cell phone, if you could put it on silent so it doesn't disturb tonight's message. And if we could bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you once again that we can gather together here in the building you provided for us, Lord, in peace and safety with the freedom that we could still enjoy, Lord, to publicly gather together and worship you and read your word, Father, and proclaim your gospel, Lord. We thank you, Father, for all your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your mercy and grace, which is renewed every day. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, Lord, to die on the cross so we could have a healed relationship with you through faith in him and all the blessings that go along with salvation, Father. Pray for the pastor tonight as he brings forth your message. Pray, Father, you would empower him by your spirit and that our hearts would be open to receive it, Lord. And also, Father, I lift up our brother, Vic, and his family, and his family, Lord, that they would be comforted in this time of loss, Father, and you would just give them a peace, Father, that they can enjoy it in this time, Father, in this time of just sorrow, Father. And I pray for all that we do tonight that it will bring glory and honor to your son Jesus. In his, in his name we pray. Amen. If we could stand and praise the Lord.
announcements, a prayer request, if you can keep Vic's family in prayer, his brother's wife passed away, if you can keep them in prayer. Um, service will be as usual Friday, 7 o'clock, and that's all I have for announcements. Children and teachers can be dismissed to class. Now it's my honor and privilege tonight to introduce our pastor, Pastor John Ritchie. Thanks, buddy. How's everybody doing tonight? Doing good? Uh, take your Bible and turn to Romans 11, then we're going to have a word of prayer. we could bow our heads we'll go before the Lord father tonight we're so grateful so thankful once again to have this opportunity to gather together with the people of God around the Word of God into the name of our risen Savior the Lord Jesus Christ I pray tonight father that you challenge our hearts as we continue to study your word, Lord, that we might continue to grow. Pray that we might be disciples truly, Lord. Those who follow you faithfully, Lord, and love your word and love the things of God. 
and operate in your plan by the power of your spirit. Strengthen our faith tonight, Lord. Encourage our hearts, challenge us, Lord, to stay motivated. And Lord, I pray that I could speak with wisdom, grace, humility, conviction, and passion, with the authority that your word deserves. I might take the knowledge and the information that you've given me on this subject, make it clear and understandable, that your people may hear and be blessed. And if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that is not saved, that does not know the Lord Jesus, my prayer is that you would convict them of sin and of their need of Christ as Savior, that they might believe upon him and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his name. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'd like you to turn with me uh, into Romans 11. Tonight we're going to continue under the conflict of the ages, looking at Satan's plan of attack on apostate Israel. Satan's plan of attack upon apostate Israel. I'd like to put our first principle up on the board, if we could. First principle up on the board. Satan wants to attack the nation Israel. He wants to destroy the nation Israel, which is in apostasy today, which has rejected their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will have his opportunity when the 70th week of Daniel comes to pass, that seven-year period that is yet future, which Bible prophecy tells us about. And at that time, Antichrist will come to power, and he will be received by the nation Israel as their Messiah, but then he will turn upon them with the ten kings that rule with him at that time, and he will try to destroy not only uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Jewish nation at that time. And this is part of the fulfillment of prophecy and God's plan for this earth and for judging the nation Israel and bringing them to repentance and restoration, a future remnant. Now, let's look at our first point. The nation Israel is apostate and under divine judgment today. Now we have to realize that Israel today is an apostate nation. They rejected their Messiah. And right now, they, according to the scripture, are enemies of the gospel. So there's nothing uh, special about Israel today. They are not God's people today. God's people today is the church. Um, and uh, many Christians uh, uh, have too much of a favoritism towards the nation Israel because the scripture does teach there's a remnant of Jews that in the future who when Christ returns after having been persecuted by Antichrist they will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ when they look upon him whom they have pierced and they will come to faith in Christ at that time and God will fulfill the promises he made to the nation Israel at that time, in that remnant that will turn to Christ when Christ returns. But today, they're an apostate nation. Let's look what it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, if you will, to 32. And the apostle Paul writes, and he says in verse 25, and in chapters 9 to 11 of Romans, Paul is discussing what is the place of the nation of Israel in God's plan. They were his chosen people. They rejected their Messiah. They have been set aside. They're under his divine judgment. The temple was destroyed. God has taken the church, which is the one new man, the mystery, that has been revealed now, and that's made of all believers, Jew and Gentile, and that is God's elect people in this day. 
But if you look at verse 25, Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, he's quoting from Isaiah 59, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So God will fulfill the new covenant with Israel, which he prophesied through Jeremiah in a future day when Jesus returns. And it says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election or God's choice of them as his what? Chosen people, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Now the thing we need to realize here is some people have rejected the hyper-dispensationalism and the, you know, the extreme dispensational of today that really slices and dices the Bible up into too many divisions. And there are many today who are now turning and rejecting the idea that God still has a plan for the nation Israel. They're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because if we study the scriptures, God definitely has a plan for the nation Israel. His gifts and the calling and the promises he made to them are without repentance. The church has not inherited Israel's promises. The church is the one new man, okay, a whole, with a whole new program. As concerning the preaching of the gospel today, the nation Israel is in unbelief. So they are enemies of the gospel. But one day in the future, when the Lord returns, after they have suffered judgment from the Lord under Antichrist, at that time, they will what? turn to the Lord in belief and a remnant will be saved when Jesus returns and that remnant which is yet future will have the fulfillment of the promises that were made to the nation so we must understand this now Satan's plan is to stop God from fulfilling in the conflict of the ages Satan's plan is to stop God from fulfilling his plan and his purpose to bring a future generation of the nation Israel to faith in Christ and to restore them and fulfill his promises and the covenant that he made with them. And that's Satan's offensive strategy for the future. Um, let's go to, if you will, Zechariah chapter 12 and let's look at this a little bit. And Antichrist is going to persecute the nation because Satan is going to want to destroy Israel so that he can stop God from fulfilling God's plan. Zechariah chapter 12, look at verses 8 to 10. If you can go to Zechariah chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. And if, you, if, you don't, if you're not there, you can look up on the board and just put it in your notes and read it later. It says here, you can read along with us, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now that day is the day when Antichrist is trying to destroy the nation and the Lord Jesus Christ will return to rescue a remnant of Israel and to deliver his people, the church, and rapture them off this earth. And it says, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Verse 9, the Lord will defend them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, that were gathered with Antichrist and their armies to destroy Israel. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. 
and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, who's the one that they pierced that they're going to look upon? The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And when they see him coming, and they shall mourn for him. They will recognize Jesus as their Messiah, a remnant, not the whole nation, because many in the nation will worship Antichrist. Okay, we'll look at this in more detail. But a remnant will turn to him, and they shall mourn for him <coughs> as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And the picture is Israel being overcome with repentant grief that's almost bitter because they fought so hard to reject him and then they see him and they realize he is their Messiah the scriptures are true he is the fulfillment of the prophets and uh, at that moment they realize all that they have suffered came upon them because of their what rejection of their Messiah okay let's put our next point up and of course in 70 AD the Lord's judgment was to destroy the temple under Titus and the Roman legions so they can't actually practice their religion but in the future they will make an agreement with Antichrist and the nations where they will be allowed to rebuild the temple and reinstitute what the sacrifices and Antichrist is going to engineer all that and they are going to accept him as their Messiah, but then at a certain point, he's going to turn on them with the ten kings that what? Support him in that oligarchy. Here's our second point. God's promise to restore a future repentant Israel will be fulfilled. Now, we've got to understand, right now, the nation Israel is under God's what? Judgment. There's nothing wonderful about them today but there is a future generation I mean they, they are enemies of the gospel the Bible says right enemies in fact the, the strict Orthodox Jew many Jews you know are, are secular irreligious you know they're Jewish in name only they don't practice Judaism but the strict Jew will you know blaspheme the name of Jesus they they consider him a fraud and, and they say terrible things about him Okay, but in the future, they are going to come to realize he is their Messiah. I want to show you another verse before we move on to this uh, fulfillment right here. I want you to go to Zechariah chapter 14. It's the same book of Zechariah. In chapter 14 of Zechariah, look at verses 1 to 4. Okay. And look what it says. We've got it up on the board if you haven't been able to get it. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and uh, half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove towards the north and half towards the south. Now leave that up there for a moment. What I want to point out is this. In the future, when Israel is under attack, they're going to suffer. The, the, the women will be raped, the city will be destroyed, some will be carried away into captivity and slavery again. This is when Antichrist turns on them at the midpoint of the, of the uh, 70th week of Daniel, when the abomination of desolation occurs and he demands to be worshipped as God. But here's the thing. There are Christians today saying, oh, no, no, this prophecy of Zechariah, that was all fulfilled uh, in 70 A.D. when the city was destroyed. And yet, it's clearly not fulfilled in 70 A.D. You have to, you have to spiritualize away the scriptures. You have to take a non-literal approach to the Bible and say that it's, it only has an allegorical or a spiritual meaning. But the truth of the matter is, 
Jesus did not stand on the Mount of Olives in 70 what? A.D. And the Mount of Olives did not split in two. Okay? We have to understand this. And the Bible tells us that when he returns to Israel, remember in Acts chapter 1 when he ascended? Uh, everybody was kind of just gawking up and saying, wow. You know, he just ascended into heaven and the angel said, hey guys, don't be amazed because the same way he what? Left is the same way he's what? Coming back. And when he comes back, guess what? He's going to touch down right on this spot where he what? Took off from. <laughs> okay? And, but in that day, he'll be coming as what? Judge. All right? And conquering king. And he's coming to rescue his people and to judge his enemies and to restore a remnant that will turn to him in that day. I'll look at, if you will, at Zechariah 14, verse 9. I just want to point out, so people don't get caught up in what's called preterism or replacement theology. And again, again, a lot of people, when they reject extreme dispensationalism, they throw the baby out with the bathwater, and they fail to recognize that God still has a program for the nation Israel. There's a future generation that's going to come to faith in Christ. And Satan is going to try to destroy them why does Satan want to destroy Jerusalem and Israel in that day? To stop God from fulfilling his what? Promises. So that he can claim what? Victory in the conflict of the ages. Uh, and of course, he's not powerful enough to what? Carry it off, right? To, to, to finish what he attempted. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. So all this is going to happen in the day when the Lord becomes king over all the earth. Well, did that happen in 70 AD? If it did, he's not doing too good a job of being king of this earth, is he? No, it didn't happen. It's yet what? Future. Okay, I'd like you to go with me now. Go with me to Psalm 89. We're going to put our next point back up again. If you wouldn't mind, uh, guys, just put that point back up. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and our next point is important. Because there will be a tremendous anti-Semitism that will take place yet future. And it'll be concentrated against the nation Israel and Jerusalem. Okay? Now, we know today that there's nothing special about the Jewish people or the Jewish nation. But in the future, there is certainly going to be a remnant to fulfill the promise. God's promise to restore a future repentant Israel will be fulfilled. Uh, look at Psalm number 89, verses 28 to 37. And... This is important because of the Davidic covenant. Um, in Acts, and don't, don't turn there. You don't have to put it up. I'll just quote it. But you can write it down for your notes if you want it. In Acts chapter 15, verses 14 to 18, James at the Jerusalem council, where they were discussing the gospel to the Gentiles, and if the Gentiles should come under the law, and of course, they came to the conclusion that you're saved by grace through faith, and they weren't to be put under the law. He said, you know, Simeon or Peter mentioned how God has visited the Gentiles to call out a people for his name, but after he's done with the Gentiles, he will return and rebuild again the tabernacle of David. And what that is a reference to is he will fulfill the Davidic covenant the covenant that he made with David that there would be a king that would descend from David's what? Lineage on the throne of Israel and it would be forever. Now the only one that can fulfill this is who? The Lord Jesus Christ who is called the son of what? David. He is the one that fulfills the Davidic covenant. And, and here's the thing, it's interesting that people who reject Israel's restoration and believe in replacement theology teach eternal security you know some of them not all of them but some of them some of them are Calvinistic some of them are not and yet they believe that God will break his promise 
to Israel and his promise to David. You see? And uh, God, the Bible says, the gifts and the calling of God are without what? Repentance. He made some promises to Israel. He's going to fulfill them. Just because they're apostate today doesn't mean they're going to be that way forever. There's a remnant that will come to Jesus Christ and fulfill those promises, which is incredibly important because it tells us God is what? Faithful. When God makes a promise, he what? He keeps it. I don't know how you can believe in eternal security, and you should, some of these teachers, and know that God keeps his promises and won't forsake you once he saved you because he promised to save you, and then teach that God's promises to Israel are null and void now. Because they're in what? Apostasy. It doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not consistent with the scriptures. All right, Psalm 89. Let's look what he said concerning David and the Davidic covenant. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. This is with David, the king that would be on the throne forever, descending from what? David, the line of David. In verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever. And his throne as the days of heaven. So this is going to be an eternal king. Verse 30, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they reject him, right? And don't walk in his ways. Look at verse 31. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments. Verse 32. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. In other words, God says, if Israel rejects me, what I will do is I will severely chastise them. I will visit them with what? The rod. And their iniquity will be what? Dealt with with stripes. In other words, I will severely judge and chastise them. Well, let's keep going. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to what? Fail. In other words, Israel will reject me. And did they reject him? Yes. Has he chastised them? Oh, yeah, it's been a couple of millennia right now, almost 2,000 years, right? That they're under what? Divine judgment, and wherever they've gone in the world, they have what? Suffered. They've also prospered. But they also, with the prospering, have what? Suffered and been persecuted. And there's yet a future generation that will suffer even greater persecution under Antichrist as Satan tries to wipe them out so he can defeat God's plan. But the truth of the matter is that he's, uh, go back to verse 33, nevertheless my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. In other words, even though I've got to chastise him, I will not forsake them. I will not forsake my promises. Now the individual Jew who rejects God and Christ course is going to suffer and be eternally punished but the nation itself will what not be forsaken there will be a fulfillment of the promises to have a restored Israel one day because God is what faithful you see now that's how he deals with what his children if we sin and we don't repent what's he do He chastises us right but does he ever forsake us? Never. I will never leave you, nor what? Forsake you, right? And he waits for us to what? Turn what? Back to him, so that he can what? Bless us once again. You see, that's the principle. Verse 34, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. He said, look, there's going to be a king on the, on the throne of Israel from the line of David, and, and the church is not Israel. Church is, is the one new man, a new thing that God is doing. Go at verse 35. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. God said in Acts 15, 14 to 18, he would rebuild the tabernacle of David after he's done with the Gentiles. In other words, after the church is finished, he returns to what? Israel. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. And this is a reference 
to the Lord Jesus Christ who will reign over the earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem. Verse 37, it shall be established forever as the moon and as the faithful, faithful witness in heaven. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 to 40. This is what he spoke to the prophet Jeremiah. Israel was going to be carried away into Babylonian captivity at this time and judged, but he talks about his plans for the future of the nation. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now this covenant is not made with anyone else but Israel. The church enters in to the blessing of this new covenant. Look at verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. Now notice the Lord was a husband to Israel. Okay, that's why we'll see when we study this further that when the Bible mentions Mystery Babylon, and people have conjectured that it's the Roman Catholic Church, it's uh, it's the city of Babylon in Iraq, it's uh, Rome, uh, it's uh, New York City, it's, you know, a bunch of different cities. But the truth is, when you study it, and I'll show it to you from, clearly from Scripture, Mystery Babylon is the city of Jerusalem who plays the harlot on her husband, God, by committing what? Unfaithfulness with Antichrist and the nations yet future and we'll look at that and I'll show you very clearly because the scripture tells us that mystery Babylon is a city a great city and if you just compare scripture with scripture you'll see it's talking about Jerusalem but we'll look at that maybe tonight we might get to some of that but look at verse 32 and I know people have all these ideas about what mystery Babylon is but you know what we need to be biblical okay we need to be biblical look at verse 32 not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Keep going. But this was, that was the Mosaic covenant. But this shall be the covenant I will make with the host of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. He says, I'll make this with Israel. Church enters into this because of grace. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. He's talking about Israel. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. God's making this promise first, and he controls all of what? Nature. He's powerful enough to fulfill it. If these ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, and those the cycles of the heavens, sun by day, moon by night, etc., then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Verse 37, Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, saith the Lord. Now just stop there. It amazes me how people can be so silly when they come to the Bible to teach that God does not have anything left in his plan for the nation Israel. It's sad because here the Lord is saying over and over again, listen, I'm not done with them. They might be enemies today. They might be under divine judgment today, but I'm going to fulfill my covenant with David and my promises to the Father, to the fathers. And they're, they're going to look on Jesus one day and they're going to what? Turn to him. And the promises I made are going to be what? Fulfilled. God keeps his what? Promises. Aren't you glad? I'm glad. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know, and well, let's keep going. Verse 38. I'm hanging on to quite a few of them. Okay? I expect them all to be fulfilled in his time. He doesn't do it on my time, but I'm expecting it. Verse 38. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, 
that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel to the gate of the corner as Jerusalem restored and the measuring line shall go forth over against it upon the hill Gera and, the, and shall compass to the Goat and then verse 40 and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy unto the Lord it shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever in other words Jerusalem will be what after it's destroyed under Antichrist when Christ returns the remnant believes he will what restore the city and they'll never again be what destroy you starting to get the picture here okay let's let's move on to Isaiah chapter 11 and there's so many scriptures that we could look at literally literally dozens and dozens of passages from the Old Testament that basically these folks who reject the fact that God still has a purpose for a remnant of Israel in the future they just either spiritualize them away ignore them or say well they all pertain to the church now and, and that's the height of what folly and foolishness that's being wise in your own conceits according to Romans chapter 11 verse 25 uh, look there, there's a restoration look at this in Isaiah which is a beautiful passage by the way you ought to read it you know where you know the, the wolf lies down with the lamb and uh, the little child plays with the snakes and doesn't you know they're not poisonous anymore when the, when the curse is removed from nature in the millennium the thousand year reign of Christ after he returns to set up his kingdom it's going to be pretty cool because uh, uh, lions and bears won't be carnivores anymore they'll be omnivores they won't be eating meat so if you want to have a bear cub as a pet you could do that I think that would be pretty cool of course lions are pretty impressive also you know uh, some people try to do it today but the problem is the curse hasn't been removed and a lot of them end up getting what eaten right but in that day the curse will be removed the scripture says there's some awesome things in the Bible you know but you got to read it and you got to believe it you know God's going I has not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for them that what love them there's some awesome things that are going to happen that we're going to see okay when we stand on this earth in a resurrected body one day when Jesus comes and it says and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand against the second again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros from Cush and from Elam and from Shana and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea and it was all over the earth God is gonna bring back the remnant of his people Israel after they've been dispersed through the earth and it's the second time the, the first time that they were brought back was after the Babylonian what captivity when a remnant came back into the land but they were in it, they were they were still not ready to accept their Messiah then this time they what will be after they suffer on the Antichrist look at verse 12 and he shall set up an ensign an ensign a big uh, sign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and shall gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth they will be brought back see Israel will be restored when they look upon him whom they have what pierced when he comes to the Mount of Olives in that day and then the whole earth will not have the knowledge of the Lord some impressive stuff go with me to Daniel chapter 11 uh, verse number 45 now let's get back to Antichrist so we see what God's plans are for Israel my my admonition to people who you know get upset with how much people overemphasize Israel today is this don't throw the baby out with the bathwater there's a future there's nothing so great about them today they do just as much evil in the world as as other people but there's a future generation okay that will come but before that they're going to commit the greatest apostasy that any nation has ever committed they're going to accept Antichrist as their Messiah okay which is going to be their greatest downfall 
Daniel chapter 11, verse 45. I just want to show you something here quickly. And let's, let's just go through this quickly. In Daniel 11, verse 45, and it's speaking of the Antichrist, and if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you need to understand the book of Daniel. Now, it says in Daniel 11:45, and he, the beast, the man of sin, the Antichrist, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. If you study the context of the whole passage, he's talking about Antichrist setting up his capital and his white house, per se, if you will, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the holy city. Okay? You see that? He's going to build it there. And he's going to operate from there. Antichrist is going to make Jerusalem his capital because it's going to accept him as their Messiah. Uh, look, if you will, uh, I want to show you something. Let's, let's look at Revelation 17, verse 1 to 6. And here's what I want you to understand. We mentioned Mystery Babylon. We may as well look at it right now. Okay? Revelation 17, verse 1 to 6. And there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, uh, the Lord calls Mystery Babylon, which we'll see is Jerusalem, a whore. Why? Because Jerusalem is supposed to be married and faithful to who? Christ. But they turn... They reject Christ, their true what husband, and they unite themselves, marry themselves to what? Another antichrist, the counterfeit Christ, Satan's man. So they commit spiritual fornication or spiritual adultery. And when a woman sleeps around, God says in the Bible, you're playing the whore or the harlot. Now don't get mad at me because I use the word whore. If you're going to get mad, get mad at God because that's the word he chose. You see, the great whore, wasn't, it was a great whore. And so don't be so prudish that that bothers you. It's, it's the Bible, and when God says it, you don't have any doubt what he's talking about, do you? You know what he means. Look at verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now, was this actual physical fornication? No, it's spiritual fornication. She was supposed to be what? Faithful to who? Jesus. But she rejects Jesus and accepts Antichrist and all the what? Kings that are with him. Okay? And it says, And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, she promoted Antichrist, and because she was so passionate in her pursuit of Antichrist, the nations went along with it. Can you imagine when that man comes along and is able to solve the Middle East crisis? and bring about peace and all the nations of the earth that are were afraid of nuclear war and nuclear threat and you know nuclear weapons going off in the Middle East and then starting a world war how happy they're gonna be they'll be made drunk with the wine of her what fornication look at verse 3 so he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns where he noted that represents the ten horns, that represents the ten kings that will promote Antichrist. The woman is sitting on the beast because at the beginning, Israel, Jerusalem will think that she's in control. Later on, Antichrist is going to turn against her. Go with verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations, and the filthiness of her fornication. Now, uh, if you look in all through the Old Testament, the, the priestly robes that the high priest and the priesthood, the Levitical priests wore, were of purple and scarlet, gold, precious stones and pearls, and uh, they also had blue, but there's no blue in this, because blue represents heavenly things and walking in God's commandments, and they're not doing that. Oh, she's not doing that at this time. Keep going. Look at verse 5. 
and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's given the name Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He was amazed. And he sees that this woman, which we're going to see, is a city. You just can't stop there now. If you stop there, you can make Mystery Babylon into just about anything you want it to be, right? Rome, New York, the real Babylon, etc. Moscow, you can make it whatever you want. But you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. That's the key, okay? Let's look at some more verses. Go to Revelation 17, verse 18. And notice what it says. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth or ruleth over the kings of the earth. So we're told that the whore, the woman, is a what? Great city that will rule over what? The nations of the earth. Okay? Let's keep going. Go to Revelation 18 verse 21. Revelation 18, verse 21, if you will. And a mighty, mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem as the whore. And found no more at all means that it will never again be what? An apostate. And notice what it says. It says, again, the great what? City. Have you noticed? It's referred to the woman is a city. Go to verse 24. It's a city that has what? The blood of the martyrs, the blood of the saints. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, here, up until this point, people have made a case that, well, see, uh, we can eliminate New York. They don't have the blood of the saints. We can eliminate Babylon. I mean, they don't have the blood of the church in their hands and maybe Israel, but not the church. And, and, and it has to be Rome because Rome persecuted Christians. But here's the problem. And, and here's the thing. Jerusalem is a city on seven hills, too, which people don't understand, not just Rome. Okay? But here's the thing. There's something else. It was not just the blood of the saints and the martyrs, but the blood of what? Prophets. Prophets. You see? And that is a very important key into understanding who is this great whore. Look at Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. The only city that killed the prophets of God was Jerusalem. And Jesus told us this, and we'll read that in a few minutes. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. So the woman, mystery, Babylon the great, is a great city that kills the saints and martyrs and prophets of God. Because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Again, a great city committing fornication. Look at Revelation 11, verse number 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street. That's the two witnesses that will witness against Antichrist. Of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now we know the city where the Lord was crucified was what? Jerusalem. It's also called what? Sodom and Egypt. Okay? Go with me to Matthew chapter 23. Verses number 29 to 39. Now here's where it all ties together. The woman, mystery Babylon the great, the harlot, the whore, that commits fornication with Antichrist and rejects her true husband, is a great city responsible for killing the saints, Christians, martyrs, and God's prophets. Okay? Look at Matthew chapter 23, look at verse 29 to 39, and here's where it all comes together. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. In other words, the, the Pharisees in Jerusalem say, hey, we're righteous. If, you know, we would have never been like our ancestors in Israel who killed the prophets that God sent to them. We wouldn't be like our ancestors in Jerusalem who killed the prophets that God sent to them. Keep going, verse 31. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Jerusalem killed the prophets of God. Keep reading. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. In other words, go ahead, kill me and fulfill. Just do what your fathers did. They, uh, Jesus is priest, prophet, and king. Kill me. I'm one of the prophets to you. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. That means... You're, you're, uh, uh, you descend from what? Vipers. You just said, you're, I don't trust you, you're poisonous snakes. Uh, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I sent unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. This is what they did in the early days of the church, as well as in the Old Testament to the true prophets of God. Who did this? Jerusalem, go back to 34. Uh, wherefore, be, oh yeah, 35, I'm sorry. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. And I'll stop there for a second. What Jesus is now saying is, I'm going to make you responsible for how wicked are your sins. It's so bad in rejecting the prophets I've sent to you and killing them, Jerusalem, that you are going to become responsible for the blood of every righteous person who ever gets slain on the earth. And this is going to happen. He's going to, righteous people who get slain today have the spirit that was behind what? Jerusalem when they what? Slew the prophets and the martyrs and the saints. And on the greatest scale ever, this is going to take place when? Yet future. In the second half of the 70th week called the Great Tribulation, when Antichrist will turn upon Jerusalem and turn upon what? Christians. Keep going. And be verse 36. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. There it is. And stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens, under her wings, and you would not. I wanted you to come to me, you wouldn't come to me. Verse 38, Behold, your host is left unto you desolate. They would, they would, now he is basically pronouncing, because you reject me, you're under what? Judgment. 70 AD, the temple was what? Destroyed, the city was destroyed. Verse 39, now notice, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me. Jerusalem, you won't see me henceforth, from now on, till ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. There's going to be a day, which we read about already, when they look upon him whom they have pierced, Zechariah said, and they will mourn with bitterness and repentance, and in that day they will acknowledge him as their Messiah, and in that day they will say what? Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They will receive Jesus Christ. Now let's tie this together for tonight. <laughs> I want you to go to John's, uh, actually I want to put our next principle up and we'll look at one more passage and we'll close. And we'll pick up with this next week. Apostate Jerusalem in the future. Now, Jerusalem today is not mystery Babylon the Great because she hasn't made her what? Bed with who? Antichrist. This is talking about Jerusalem what? future okay but we know she's responsible for the death of what the saints 
and the martyrs and God's what? Prophets, according to Jesus. Okay? Look what it says. Apostate Jerusalem in the future will accept Antichrist as their Messiah. They will be a harlot nation, unfaithful to their true Lord Jesus Christ. They will be the harlot because they will be committing spiritual adultery with Antichrist. Turn to John chapter 5, verse 36 to 43. We'll close here and tie this together tonight. Actually, I might give you one more scripture after this, but and then we could pick up at a certain point next time. I want to tie it together. Look at John 5, 36. Uh, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. But I have a greater witness than that of John, John the Baptist. He said, John the Baptist witnessed to me. Right? If you believe John was from God, then you should what? You should accept all me, right? For the works which the Father had given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, the miracles. And the Father had sent me, that the Father had sent me, verse 37. And the Father himself which had sent me had borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he had sent him ye believe not, ye reject me. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Verse 40. And you will not come to me that you might have life. He wanted them to be saved, but they what? Rejected him. Look at verse 41. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. He knew their hearts. Look at verse 43. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, notice what Jesus said, him ye will receive. When Antichrist comes and has the solution to the what? Middle East crisis, and brings about what? Peace and safety, and promotes that covenant and agreement with Israel and the nations and allows them to reinstitute what? The, uh, their sacrifices and rebuild the temple. Israel will what? Go after him. They will go whoring after him. Okay? Committing spiritual adultery. Having rejected their true husband and true Messiah, Jesus the Christ, they will receive what? They will go play the harlot with what? Another man, the man of sin, the counterfeit Christ, who presents himself to them as their Messiah. And he will establish his what? Capital in Jerusalem. Let me give you a couple more verses quickly, just to make this all tied uh, together. Uh, look at Daniel chapter 11, if you will. Go to Daniel chapter 11. I want to start with verse 31, if you will, and we'll, we'll close here, I promise. But I want to get this in so that it all ties together. Okay, Daniel, and in Daniel chapter number 11. Look at verse... Now, this, this part of Daniel is talking about Antichrist and his career. And it says uh, in verse 31, And arm shall stand on his part, that's military might, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh what? Desolate. Now what's the abomination of desolation? According to the book of Daniel, and according to Jesus, and according to the Apostle Paul, it's when the man of sin goes into the temple and sets up his image and demands to be what? Worship. We also find that in the book of Revelation. We'll look at that next time. Okay? All right? So he, he stops the sacrifice and he sets up his image. And he begins his what? Persecution of Israel. Verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Um, he will corrupt them by flatteries. In other words, he'll uh, 
like a man who lures a woman into adultery, he'll sweet talk them. He'll say all the right things to Israel. He'll be so nice to them. And he'll persuade them that he's the one. And they will what? Receive him. Uh, quickly, verse 36 and 37. And the king, referring to Antichrist, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god because he will demand to be worshipped what as god according to what second thessalonians chapter 2 paul and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods he will blaspheme the name of what jesus christ and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done he has his time 1260 what days three and a half years Verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. He will probably be, be a what? A Jew. How could the Jewish nation, how could Jerusalem ever accept anyone as their Messiah unless he was what? Jewish. But he will reject the God of what? His fathers. Not, he will reject the God of Israel. He is what? His God is Satan. He's Satan's seed. Nor the desire of woman which may be a reference to the fact that he will be a homosexual, that he will reject women, okay? Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above what? All. Wow. That's given us a little glimpse into the career of Antichrist. And, and so as we close in Satan's plan, his goal is to what? attack and try to destroy Jerusalem in the future to block God from what fulfilling his promise to restore a remnant that will accept who Christ when he returns so that he can fulfill his covenant with David and the new covenant that he made with the house of Israel you see and Jerusalem will play the harlot in the future when she gets what? Into bed and commits spiritual adultery with who? Antichrist. She is Mystery Babylon the Great, that great city, the harlot, because she's unfaithful to who? Her true husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's close there tonight. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, tonight we're so grateful <coughs> and so thankful, Lord, to have had this time to know and to study these things from your word. And I do pray, Father, that you would challenge our hearts tonight, that we might continue to grow in grace. And if there be anyone within the sound of my voice, if you're unsaved, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And right now, in the privacy of your own heart and your own mind, you can tell God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you and you alone as my Savior and my Lord. Let's take a moment of silent prayer for anyone who wishes to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, Father, tonight, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart and they have believed upon the Lord Jesus, my prayer is that you would 
Give them assurance that you've forgiven them and saved them. Pray that you would reveal your love to them in a special way. And I ask that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray as we depart tonight, that you take the written word and make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. And ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Folks, it has been a great pleasure. Have a great night. There, there will be Bible class Friday.